first. Um, welcome, everyone. It's so good to see so many people here. Uh, I'm excited by the size of the crowd. My name is Chris Mead. I'm a faculty member here in the Honors College, where I also direct our integrated minor in human rights and resources. Uh, events such as this one are the work of many hands, and I'd like to begin by thanking our sponsors, uh, Brenda Bowen and the Global Change and Sustainability Center, Jeff McCarthy and the Graduate Program in Environmental Humanities. In honors, I would like to thank Holly Edwards, Jeanette Taylor, Cindy Brager, and Dominic uh, Sicararo, and for their always uh, cheerful help and assistance uh, in making everything happen. Finally, our deans, uh, Manisha Kathipathy and Rachel Hayes Harp, who have been unfailing in their support for this kind of programming. Thank you. Just going to say a couple things uh, before we turn things over to Grant. Uh, the Honors College has long been interested in creating interconnected educational experiences for our students. One subject leads to another, and indeed one of the deepest pleasures, I think, of learning involves finding that one intellectual discovery often leads into another. At the same time, the Honors emphasis on contextuality also recognizes that many of our most pressing issues as a species, issues that will surely come up during tonight's talk, require integrated and multidisciplinary forms of thinking. Our hope and honors is that in integrated minors anchored by themes such as human rights and resources, students will experience cross-disciplinary thinking as something more than a hashtag or a line on a marketing pamphlet. While this kind of learning is fun, giving students the opportunity to think about a theme over the course of several semesters with a group of like-minded peers, it is not idle. It is our fervent hope that these lessons in contextual thinking and understanding the mutual determination of the local and the general and the power of thinking about important problems in diverse disciplinary, from diverse disciplinary angles will help form our students into leaders adequate to the challenges that we face. Our speaker tonight is one of those leaders, someone who is adopting novel approaches to big problems, taking paradigms that would seem to safely belong in one area and probing their applicability in others. Not only has his effort already had concrete results, it has also offered a useful provocation to those still laboring under the fantasy that human rights can meaningfully be separated from the environmental conditions that stand as a prerequisite for thought and indeed for life itself. Recognizing the pleasure of being together, I'd just like to invite everyone to put their phones away uh, and to focus on being here together um, as we give Grant uh, our richest forms of attention. Uh, I'm super pleased to introduce the student who will introduce our speaker, kind of cascading introductions here. Um, Emma Bernard, Bernards. Bernards, thank you, having a moment. We'll introduce uh, Grant. Emma is an honor student, a junior, a sterling mind stolen from BYU, and a history major interested in social and environmental justice, queer histories, and the Northern Irish Troubles. She's also currently completing her coursework in the Honors Integrated Minor in Human Rights and Resources. She's worked as a social justice advocate at BU, a summer camp for adolescents with HIV and AIDS, and is currently serving as a peer mentor in Honors. Wilson is the executive director and directing attorney of the Earth Law Center, an organization dedicated to advancing laws, movements, and education that places our planet at the center. He has a Bachelor of Arts in Environmental Policy from Huxley College of the Environment at Western Washington University and a JD with a Certificate in Environmental and Natural Resources Law from Lewis and Clark Law School. Before working for the Earth Law Center, he was involved in a legal campaign for women's and environmental rights in Kenya, researched climate change law and policy in Hungary, and engaged in policy work related to conservation of wildlife and other and wild places in the Pacific Northwest amidst other projects. Grant is a leading expert on the rights of nature, ecocentric law, water law, international environmental law, and human environmental rights. He has spent the last decade fighting for the rights and interests of nature all over the world. 
including by writing the new or by writing new rights of nature laws and winning decisive courtroom victories for rivers and other ecosystems. Now, please join me in giving and welcoming Grant for his lecture on giving nature a voice in the legal system, rights of nature and other legal inventions. All right, thank you so much for the generous introduction and thank you to Professor Mead and uh, the university as well as the honors program for having me here today. Um, we're gonna have some slides to accompany our talk. My communications person says, Grant, you need big, beautiful pictures. I say, I'm a lawyer and the words mean everything to me. How can you take those away? And we kind of met in the middle. Um, if you're interested in the legal nuances, especially if you're writing a thesis and wanna cover these topics, you might move on up or watch the recording. Otherwise, you can uh, just squint those out and look at the pretty pictures on the side. Um, so I'm here today to talk to you about a legal revolution, on the one hand, that is new, because especially in the last five years, all over the world, there's been these movements bubbling up to recognize that nature is not just property, not just a resource, but instead has intrinsic value and perhaps rights. But on the other hand, it's very old, because for all of time, since time immemorial, Humans have lived in harmony with nature and consider themselves to be part of the natural world and not separate from it. And this coexistence with the rest of nature has been really shattered in the last five to 700 years, during which time this Western legal framework that treats nature as our mere property has emerged as the status quo in, in most jurisdictions across the world. And you know, the big thing I want you to think about throughout this presentation is not necessarily that one approach is better than another approach or that something's right or wrong or will never work or, or could work, but rather to invite you to use your own imagination to think about what would a legal system look like in which we expanded the scope of the law to include not just humans, but nature. And if you think of how complex the legal system is, you can imagine there's thousands, if, if not more, ways that we can give nature a role, a voice, a stake, within our law and within our political system. So I encourage you, as I go through many examples from across the world of how this idea of nature's voice in the law is manifesting to think about other ways that might work or which ways you think are interesting. And it's gonna be very comparative. We're gonna do a little journey to different governments uh, and regions across the world. So um, if you're doing a comparative thesis on international environmental law or foreign law issues, this, there'll be a lot here for you. And if not, uh, you might consider doing so. Um, I think you've already been introduced to Earth Law Center. Uh, I will say we work across the world, but we're based in Southwest Colorado. Um, I found it's a beautiful place to live, and I felt that those dreaming up the future of environmental law and governance should live amongst forests and hot springs and rivers and these sorts of things. And um, Salt Lake City is, in fact, one of the closest major cities to where I am, so I sort of feel like this is a, a second home, so really good to be here. Um, just to set a little context, why are we even talking about radical environmental change. And um, this is a river <laughs> that's on fire. And um, in the 1970s, during the first big um, kind of environmental law revolution, or really the emergence of traditional environmental law, we saw rivers on fire. We saw uh, the proliferation of chemicals in, in our yards and in our foods. We saw really ecosystems beginning to you know, shudder under the weight that we were uh, putting upon them. And we passed all these cool environmental laws like the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act. And these laws have done a lot of good. They've held the line. They've reduced the amount of degradation. But they haven't solved the environmental crisis. And we know there's a climate crisis. We know there's a biodiversity crisis, uh, as well as a pollution one. It's a poly crisis. And I'm not going to go into any of that science or information because I think we see it enough. Um, but the point is that traditional environmental laws have done a good job of holding the line, but not enough to actually achieve a state of mutual health and well-being of humans and nature together. And um, you know, we see now ecosystems, despite these environmental laws, still on the verge of collapse, and have to ask ourselves, is there a better frame of governance to achieve um, what my goal is anyway, healthy ecosystems? Um, and when I say healthy ecosystems, I include those that we live in because we are all part of nature and we all live in an ecosystem, even right now. Um, so just you know, one example of an environmental law that we have that's pretty good, but maybe not good enough, an endangered species law. Um, this is really kind of indicative of the larger environmental law system. 
It's a law that kicks in once a species is right on the brink of extinction, walking up to the cliff of total collapse. And at that point, this law kicks in, and it's really great because it protects you know, wolves uh, all the way down to you know, tiny little fish that are on the verge of extinction. Um, but what about a species and their right to be healthy, to have thriving populations, to exist in a state of well-being in connection with all other life? Um, that's not something the Endangered Species Act does. And uh, here's where the, you know, the legal nerds can you know, squint and look at, look at some more information. Um, I want to differentiate the status quo of current laws from what I'm talking about, which you can call ecocentric laws or earth laws. And ecocentric just means the ecosystem is the focal point, as opposed to something that's anthropocentric, where it's all about humans. And um, a couple of things I want to highlight. One, under most laws, our culture, our beliefs, uh, with, with exceptions, particularly uh, indigenous cultures and beliefs, uh, we consider humans as being separate from nature. It's us versus them. It's humans and then the natural resources. It's um, legal protections for us and management for, for them, the rest of nature. Earth law, ecocentric law, whatever you want to call it, understands that we're all part of this large interconnected web of life. And that's the central thesis of uh, the legal systems that we create under this framework. Um, one other thing I want to highlight, because we're going to talk a lot about the rights of nature. This is one movement in this larger vision I'm talking about, but it's, it's one that kind of um, demonstrates a lot of the points I want to make. Um, the third box there, under the current legal system, nature has no rights or voice in our legal system. There's really two options in the law. You're a person with rights or you're a thing without rights. Nature falls into the thing bucket. Uh, and so do future generations, and that includes future generations of people. They don't have, by and large, formal rights or a voice in the legal system. And of course, these are all the billions of people who will exist and you know, inherit the planet that we leave them. What if we gave them a voice in the law as well? Um, and these are just a few movements that encapsulate these ideas, the rights of nature, rights of future generations, voice of nature, um, ecocentric governance, and others. And if you uh, just want to come away with one thing, just you know, this image on the front of our law school course book that I encourage you to pick up a copy of um, kind of tells it all. You know, what if, what if all these entities had a voice in the legal system? Um, rights of nature I'll talk about a lot. Uh, so much to say about rights of nature. Um, I encourage you to evaluate it critically. Um, I'm going to give you a lot of case example, case studies of how it's working or not in different jurisdictions. But undeniably, it's proliferating rapidly around the world from something that only 10 years ago was um, only in a few scattered jurisdictions to something that's now uh, national law in at least five countries, depending on how you count, subnational law in at least 35 countries, depending on how you count, at the United Nations, in the Convention on Biological Diversity. It's happening all over the world including in the United States, uh, which has been challenging, and I'll talk about that. Um, but I want to take you on a little tour around the world, talk about how this idea of nature having rights, which I'll kind of explain first, um, is playing out in different cultures. So nature having rights. Um, why would you do that? What does it look like? What are the pitfalls? Humans have rights. Corporations have rights. Uh, and the basic premise is that, you know, all life that exists inherently has a right to be here as much as we do. And um, in Latin America, this has kind of been the engine behind the whole movement. It's the heart and soul of the rights of nature movement. Almost every country in Latin America has either passed a law saying that nature has rights just like we do, or is talking about doing so. It's, it's being taught in universities and law schools. It's in the courts. It's part of the, the public dialogue. Um, Ecuador was the first country to put nature, um, nature's rights in its constitution in 2008. And since then, it's uh, been fought in the courts, where there's been a cloud forest in the courts against a mining company. And the mining company did not adequately consider nature's rights and interests before its permit was approved, and so its permits were invalidated. Uh, these things are happening in Ecuador, uh, which is really interesting. Um, one case to pay attention to is on the Dulce Pamba River. What rights does nature have? Um, I would say that depends on the ecosystem type. Nature might have a right to exist, a right to health. For rivers, 
rivers might have a right to adequate flows to sustain its ecosystem, or perhaps a right to uh, flow freely. And the Dulce Pamba River case is a case where the Constitutional Court is going to look at a dam that is devastating a river and devastating a local community where this dam is causing flooding that has killed local community members and is also impairing the livelihoods of agriculturalists there, um, which is what I call a co-violation, a violation of human rights and the rights of nature. And we heard in the beginning, and it's completely true, without protecting nature, which is our life support system, which is part of us, we cannot protect humans. And you know, when I talk about rights of nature, I'm also always talking about interconnected human rights. And when I talk about human rights, I'm talking about the rights of nature because we are part of nature. Uh, but the Dulce Pamba River is uh, a case to definitely pay attention to. In Colombia, um, they didn't have rights of nature in their constitution, uh, but a case was brought to their highest court, the Constitutional Court. And the case was about illegal gold mining as well as legal gold mining in this river the Atrato River. And um, this gold mining was causing cyanide and mercury pollution, and it was causing birth defects and cancer clusters and all these health impacts to people as well as harming ecosystems. And they brought this case to court and you know, said, you know what, these, these, uh, this mining's violating our rights. And the court said, you know what, um, we agree you have your rights as you know, local communities along the river. One of those rights is something called biocultural rights, which is a cool, cool area of rights. Biocultural rights means basically that you have a right to live in relationship with um, a landscape or an ecosystem. And um, you know, the court said, if you have this right to kind of live in this relationship with this ecosystem, that ecosystem's rights have to be recognized as well. And they made this landmark ruling on the rights of the Atrato River. And um, the other cool thing about it was um, the the courts looked to different jurisdictions that had done rights of nature cases elsewhere. They looked to New Zealand, which we'll talk about. They looked to India, which we'll talk about. And in this case and elsewhere, there's kind of this conversation happening amongst judges who have seen the shortcomings of traditional environmental laws and are looking for something that systematically addresses environmental harms. And um, the Atrato River case in Colombia really was case in point for that. Um, the other interesting thing there, which I mentioned earlier to a couple of folks, is that this was the last case of a justice, Justice Palacio, before he retired. And I thought that was just kind of cool. Like, it's your last case. You walk in there. It's, you know, this river pollution case. And you're like, you know what? We're going to say this river has rights, and we're going to have to restore it and stop the mining. And you drop the mic, and you walk out. And so actually, one of my big legal strategies is finding judges who, in their last ruling, are willing to do, like, big things like this is for the grandchildren and they walk out and they're, they, you know, they kind of do this and they, they, you know, take off the robe and drive home quietly and just feel good about it. Um, if anyone wants to start a nonprofit, I was thinking like last final decision or it could be called that or something. I'm always thinking of new nonprofits. Um, the other thing that happened, you know, so that's, that's the old retired judge. The other thing in Colombia is young people are stepping up in uh, Panama. Um, we worked with their uh, national government and a group called the Leatherback Project uh, to write a new national law saying nature has rights. Um, also create another cool principles in the courts like in dubio pro natura, when in doubt, protect nature. That's a thing now in Panama. Uh, and the lawmaker who ushered this through, do I have a picture of him? I think I have a picture of him. Uh, I, I deleted the picture. Um, he was 26 years old, um, which I think is the coolest thing. 26 year old lawmaker, and um, Juan Diego Vasquez Gutierrez, uh, working with a 20-something-year-old scientist there, Callie Vilenturf, and the Leatherback Project. And, and our lawyers are like in their 30s uh, for the most part, you know, passing these new laws on ecocentrism and making nature a focal point of the law. So I think that's pretty cool. So those are my, my two target age groups oftentimes. Um, and yeah, Latin America is just, they're innovating right now, which is, which is really great. Uh, but Europe. I'd like to go to Europe second because they're kind of relatable to, to some folks around here. We both have the kind of same playbook for environmental laws, clean water laws, environmental impact laws, endangered species laws, a lot of similarities. Uh, Spain, their national legislature, passed a new law saying that this lagoon called Mar Menor is a, that's a picture of the North Sea, um, similar, <laughs> there's some water and it's beautiful. Um, Mar Menor um, is a person with rights. The cool thing here is, Okay, you say this, this lagoon has rights. How does it speak? What does it say? 
um, they created this guardianship body where they appointed all these local representatives to collectively speak for uh, the lagoon. Not only speak for the lagoon, but they are the lagoon, legally speaking. Just as if you have a lawyer, as a child or disabled person in the court, they're representing you directly. You know, these people are the lagoon. Um, and so that's really cool, and I think something that, you know, in the U.S. we can look to as an example. Um, one shortcoming of this model is, you know, when they picked who to speak for the lagoon, um, it wasn't just people who, you know, cared about nature deeply. It was also some in different industries and, um, and, you know, cattle industry and so forth. Um, so more of a multi-stakeholder approach. I love multi-stakeholder approaches. Get all those folks together, hash it out, come, out, come up with some win-win solutions. Uh, but if you're giving a voice to an ecosystem directly, my thought is that you should have people speaking for it who really have its best interests in mind in all cases. Um, in New Zealand, Aotearoa, um, there's some interesting stuff happening there with personhood for the Wanganui River. Um, there was a treaty settlement um, in New Zealand between the Crown government and the indigenous Maori people. And um, they've had a lot of treaty settlements. And you know, this all arises from um, you know, colonial history and not that unfamiliar to, to uh, people here. Um, and they had a treaty settlement to kind of resolve you know, hundreds of years of injustices. And one of those treaty settlements with the Wanganui River, um, they declared that river to be a person and similarly created a guardianship body. And those are the two guardians who legally are the river to speak for it. And they embedded all these um, Maori beliefs and customs into this agreement along with giving the river a voice and a face in law and um, it's, you know, it's been really effective so far in that you know, this river can um, enter into contracts, it can negotiate, it can you know, purchase land or space to restore itself if it wants to do so. Um, and uh, they're beginning to um, you know, re-earth uh, Maori traditions that were lost through a Western governance framework. The flip side of the coin, some people are skeptical about this model uh, in some ways, it was a political bargain. Let's say you're an indigenous people and you have a traditional relationship with a river, and in fact, the Maori say, I am the river and the river is me. They're totally inseparable. And um, you would like sovereignty over it because the river was taken from you. Um, the idea that the river owns itself, which is really what the rights of nature is about, the river owns itself and it has guardians to protect its interests, that's a step below full sovereignty over the river as a people. It's kind of a compromise. The indigenous people and the, the uh, New Zealand crown government, neither of them owns it, but they co-manage it together and it owns itself. So the point here is that personhood for a river can be a tool in colonial legal systems. Um, it can also embrace indigenous worldviews and incorporate that into governance and giving the river a voice and considering its interests and so forth. Uh, but it's also kind of a, you know, can be seen as a political bargain. Um, so, you know, rights of nature, ecocentric law is a new tool that you can use if you're an environmental policy advisor or government and there's complicated environmental issues to solve and we're trying to move in a direction of restoring ecosystems. It's a new tool that you can use and this certainly played out in New Zealand. Africa, um, Africa is kind of just starting to emerge in the rights of nature movement. Um, a couple things to say there, Uganda passed this cool national law saying nature has rights, but then they added only where designated by an administrative body. So it's kind of like a park system. You can like designate a park and that park has rights. So it's a little bit to be seen uh, how that's gonna play out. Um, but there's a thriving movement in Nigeria for the rights of this beautiful river, river that bubbles up magically from a cottonwood tree called the River Ethiop. And uh, Nigeria, I believe, in the future is going to be the most populous country in the world. It already is by far in Africa. And um, I, I just read in the future, one in four people in, the, in, it's in 30 years or 40 years will be um, from Africa. And so it's an exciting place to pay attention to where um, I think a big legal precedent in Africa will um, set a lot of precedent for other locations and probably uh, play a role in the global stage. Asia's interesting. All right, so in Asia, there's a court case for uh, the rights of the Ganges and Yamuna rivers. Uh, has anyone been to India before? 
Okay, a couple of people in India. India, um, if you go to India, if you go to New Delhi and you go a couple hours to the north, you end up in these sacred towns like Hardwar, where people go on these pilgrimages. They go, you know, they travel for days to go to the river and they worship the river as a deity, including under Hinduism. And you look around and there's these like giant statues of, of the river goddess and you can look at it and then people are, are like splashing the water in themselves and getting in the water, bringing home the water to their family because it's basically a, it's a deity, it's a god, it's something they worship and is part of their religion and culture. And you know, how do you treat something like that? Well, I said earlier under the law, rivers are property, they're a resource, natural resource, we own them, you have water rights. That's the case in India too. But they're like, wait a minute, this is a deity. Like, how can it be just this piece of property under the law? And I think if you look at any religion, you can relate to that. Um, I'll talk, about, I think I even mentioned there in the Middle East, um, you know, I visited there and talked to them about ecocentrism. And on the one hand, nature's property and they own it. And on the other hand, in, in uh, the Quran, there's this belief that the earth is a mosque. Um, you can look at every major religion and, you know, you, you can oftentimes read them to, assert dominion over nature. You can read that into a lot of religious texts, or you can look at religious texts and, and see that humans have a duty to steward nature and to protect it, and that uh, nature and the planet is sacred. Um, the Yale School of Religion and Ecology and, and many others are looking at these issues. Uh, but in India, you know, this river that's a deity, how do you protect it? And, you know, they basically said, well, this river should have rights under the law. And they looked at other case studies where in Indian legal system, they've talked about deities as persons or more than humans. And, and they declared its rights in a court case. Um, and then they said, okay, so it has rights. Well, the state government, Uttarakhand is the state, is going to be its guardian. Um, and the state was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't know about that. They're like, this is like, this is a god. This like the river can flood and people are gonna die. People drown in the river. Like, how am I supposed to be like the guardian of, of a deity? That sounds like a big responsibility. If you have a kid, you know, it's like you're responsible and they throw a party in your basement. And this is, you know, and the kids come over and someone's driving home. And this is like that, you know, times a million. Um, and so um, they actually appealed the case and it got stayed in the highest court in India. Kind of lesson there was is that if you declare rights for a river, for a deity, for something huge and grand, you really need to lay out through clear legal terms what that means. There's a guardian, such as the state of Uttarakhand. What are the limitations to their liabilities? What do they have to do? Are they gonna get sued if someone drowns in the river? That wasn't really clear when they uh, had this big landmark ruling and it's definitely, um, I think a lesson for the future, but also a, um, a demonstration that we need more sophisticated lawyers and legal experts to explore these areas um, and really um, have in-depth explanations of how they work. Uh, but India has not been deterred since then. They've been declaring rights for other ecosystems and species, which is uh, really cool. Um, I wanna talk about indigenous rights of nature highlights. Um, these are just some examples. Um, there are many indigenous nations that are looking at the rights of nature or have already embraced it. And you know, it kind of goes like this. Uh, many indigenous traditions and beliefs understand that um, humans have a duty to steward nature, um, that we have a duty of reciprocity to give back to nature, um, that we have inherent relationships with sacred waters, lands, and everything therein. And if you roughly translate those beliefs into a Eurocentric legal system, you, it looks something like the rights of nature. Um, and so there's some you know, examples here, the Ponca Nation, the Nez Perce, the Yurok, um, the dean of Quinney Law School wrote a great article about um, tribal nations and rights of nature that I encourage you to read. And actually, um, the first nation to acknowledge the rights of nature, I mentioned Ecuador in 2008. It was the Diné, the Navajo, who in 2003, in the Navajo Nation Code, um, acknowledged the rights of, um, of uh, Mother Earth and Father Sky and their responsibility to steward them. And so, um, there is a long indigenous tradition here and it is growing more and more. Um, you know, there are other you know, indigenous partners of ours who are, as I mentioned before, not so much into the Eurocentric rights-based framework. And you know, that might be an oversimplification of these you know, immensely deep and since time immemorial beliefs and relationships with nature. And so you know, we also work on relationship-based frameworks outside of Western legal systems. 
And you know, a couple of things to note here, um, there are some interfaces between you know, customary belief from indigenous peoples and Western laws. Um, one that's interesting is kinship with species, understanding that certain species are a family member. Um, I was the lawyer for uh, Lummi elders um, who were working to bring back a captive southern resident orca from the Miami Seaquarium, in part based on the understanding this was their family member. And people, even some of the animal rights groups, were like, you're going you're gonna to like, release it from this aquarium? It's in Miami, and it's, it's home waters, and the Salish Seas are all the way you know, in the Pacific Northwest. Isn't it, it's, it's 50 years old. Is it going to die in the, during the flight out there? And is this like a really safe thing to do? And then other people were like, this poor orca has been in this t tiny tank for 50 years. And like, uh, we, you know, of course, we got to bring it back. Like, I know it's, maybe there's some risk, but we're going to do everything we can. And it was to the Lummi people, the indigenous elders, who, who said, you know, basically, we are the relatives of orcas. Um, we call them people under the sea. And if someone's your relative, I think you oftentimes have to make complex medical decisions in their best interest. And this is, you know, kind of what happened here. Um, eventually, they cut, cut a deal with the uh, Miami Seaquarium, and we, we were off the case at that point, um, and its new owners, to, to bring her home. Uh, unfortunately, she died about two months ago um, after they made this agreement to bring her to her home waters. Uh, but I'm hopeful that you know, her legacy and the movement that people made to understand that this orca is not a piece of property, it's not a thing, it deserves you know, freedom and, and, and rights as much as we do, uh, can reverberate. And we actually have a, a rights of southern resident orcas campaign in Washington State and British Columbia and the Salish Sea that, um, that I think is really exciting. Um, the other thing that will sink into our next slide is um, indigenous and non-indigenous understandings of how do we value nature. And this is so important, and I'm going to like get beyond the rights of nature a little bit here. How do we value nature? Traditionally, in our current legal system, in our economy, we often value nature for its economic value. It has a price on it. You can buy it. You can sell it. You can put it into marketplace. Other people can buy it. You can make it into derivatives. Uh, water has a value, a tree, lumber has a value, animals have value, you can put a value on everything. That's how we, we treat property. Um, but there's a, a growing understanding, um, and we can look at here, that there's many other ways to value nature. Economic value is one. Intrinsic value is another. Nature just has value because of its existence. There's the understanding we are part of nature, and that's a way to value nature. It's, it's part of us. Um, there's kinship, which is what I just mentioned. We value nature because it's a relative. And in international law, in the Biodiversity Treaty, the Convention on Biological Diversity, which a lot of people have heard of the Climate Treaty, there's an equally significant biodiversity treaty. It doesn't get talked about quite as much. In this treaty last December, uh, we've been pushing for years to include this idea of rights of Mother Earth and nature's intrinsic value, ecocentrism, in uh, the application of this big biodiversity treaty. And they, they had a huge conference, and they're, they're coming together and saying, OK, here's for how for the next 10 years we're going to implement this treaty. And um, you know, we said you know, one of the fundamental principles of this treaty should be things like nature's intrinsic value, its rights. Let's consider nature's interests, not just humans, in this treaty. Um, and it got down to the final negotiations. There was a lot of other groups pushing for this as well. It wasn't just us. It was a big team effort. And really, uh, Bolivia became the big champion for this idea. They're like, you know what? Uh, and they're a rights of nature country. Uh, you know what? We think rights of nature should be one of the principles in this treaty. Doesn't mean everyone has to say nature has rights. Doesn't mean everyone has to believe in ecocentrism. But it should be one of the ways this treaty is applied. And it was the last day, and Argentina starts opposing this vehemently. They're like, no, we don't want this in there. And um, I don't have formal verification of this. But I will say that the last day of negotiations Lionel Messi, the GOAT, won the World Cup for Argentina. And one way or another, they let it go. And uh, again, no one's told me that it's met Lionel Messi in overtime and his, his kicks. And, and France almost made the comeback, but he, you know, he had that a, a couple amazing shots. Um, no one's told me directly that Argentina backed off because of their elation over the World Cup and Mes Lionel Messi. It could be true. Uh, politics are funny like that. But nonetheless, Argentina backed off. Bolivia got it through. And now in this global biodiversity treaty, there's principles of the rights of nature, ecocentrism, nature's intrinsic value. 
Again, not everyone has to do them, but they're in there. That's happening in international treaties. Also happening in international treaties, notice how far my hand is, are the rapid proliferation of marketplaces for nature. You heard of carbon, has anyone heard of carbon credits? You heard of biodiversity credits? It's the next big thing. And if you, you know, if you thought carbon credits were big, biodiversity credits, which puts a price on biodiversity, what's it worth to restore 1% of biodiversity in a certain area, whatever that means, um, they're gonna be even bigger and it's gonna be a trillion dollar a year market very soon. And you can imagine, I'm talking about nature's intrinsic value and stuff, that's a little bit uncertain about, you know, is it a good idea to go all in on putting a price on everything. Some people say, yeah, like, frick, yeah, trillion dollars a year going towards biodiversity restoration. Like, have you lost your mind? Let's definitely do that. Other people are like, are, uh, so we're gonna quadruple down on market solutions and putting a price on nature and all these things that kind of got us in this mess to begin with. That tension has not at all been resolved and it's gonna be playing out uh, in the next couple of years, especially at the next biodiversity conference. So if you're interested in that, another thesis topic, no one has any idea how it's gonna be resolved, if at all, and I've talked to the, you know, the highest leaders in these spaces, and we need creative solutions. All right, um, I'm just gonna go over about, um, we'll do 10 more minutes. Uh, I'm gonna kind of go beyond the rights of nature now and talk about a couple other ecocentric law developments. So we talked all about nature having rights, some indigenous beliefs. Should nature have a price on it, or should it have intrinsic value, and, and, and all these things? Um, how does this play out in the corporate world? Um, corporate law is not going away. Um, and the thing about corporations, I'm very I'm a skeptical about corporations as the next guy, but uh, I'm skeptical of how fast governments can move too to make uh, major environmental changes. The thing about corporations is they move quickly. Give them something to do that goes in the system, zip zap, emails, you know, meetings, synergy, and it's done in this big way. And, um, can we introduce ecocentrism into a corporate setting is, has kind of been a question and a debate. Um, we've tried. We worked with a company in the United Kingdom that came to me and said, Grant, uh, we want nature to be our CEO of the company. And like, you're a rights of nature lawyer, you can figure that out. And I'm like, oh, shit. okay, I'll try. Um, and we got together with another group called Lawyers for Nature, uh, a group called Vo uh, Voice of Nature, and you're hearing a theme here, and kind of talked it over, and we're like, oh, it's like a CEO. CEOs have to make, I'm kind of a CEO, I'm an executive director, constant little decisions all day long, hundreds of them. And we're like, that sounds too complicated for like the first test run. So we're like, what about a board member? They have to make a lower number of high impact decisions, you know, once a month or once a quarter, whatever it is. And so we went for that, and we worked with one of the biggest law firms in the world, uh, and said, is it even legally defensible to put nature on a board? Or what about like capitalism? Doesn't that not work? And they d we did together this in-depth legal analysis and in the UK looked at uh, what the duty of a board member is. And a board member has a duty to promote the success of the company. What does success mean? Well, traditionally that means like quarterly stock prices and maximum yield of, or you know, everyone getting their, their dividends for the quarter. Uh, but you know, the law is beginning to shift towards a multi-generational perspective and also towards an understanding that humans need a healthy climate and uh, stable ecosystems in order to survive and thrive. And the courts are picking that up. And so if you interpret this duty of a board member in that lens, you can say that nature could be a board member and it would be looking at the multi-generational impacts of the company on nature. And in fact, it would consider the company to be a larger, uh, one small piece of this larger ecosystem and it would be legally defensible to put nature on a board of directors. In the US, it's a little bit different standard. Board members have a duty to typically maximize shareholder value. Uh, we did just see that there's 50 types of value and nature's economic value is one of them. So maybe there's some wiggle room there. Um, but yeah, we they appointed two people to speak as nature on their board of directors. They are nature and they, um, you know, evaluate business decisions on behalf of, of nature, and that's something that's happening uh, and is being rolled out to um, other places as well. You could do the same thing with representing future generations on a board of directors as well, with a proxy that speaks for future generations. I think that would be cool. If anyone has a small company, come talk to me. We're looking for innovators here. Um, 
And then we get to the question whether on a board of directors or a government, who speaks for nature? And um, it's very complicated. We talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, one thing is you need good lawyers to come up with ways to make sure whoever speaks for nature is doing so authentically and has their best interest in mind. There's a lot of precedent for this for children who have a legal guardian and the courts have to make sure that's the right person and they're representing their interests and so forth. Um, <clears throat> but local community members are good folks to speak for nature. Um, you, can have, you can have a trustee trust relationship, which we'll talk about a little more in a second. Um, kin is something I mentioned. What about with that orca case if the Lummi elders spoke, spoke for them legally? Um, and you can even look at things like uh, technologies like DAOs if you're into cryptocurrency and different ways of uh, giving nature a voice. We'll say there's no perfect way to do it. We're learning a lot. Uh, but I think just going out there and like inviting people to begin to speak for nature is really cool. Um, I would invite all the big companies of the world to have one board meeting where at least one person speaks for nature, even if it's non-binding in the room. And, you know, it can have a kind of transformative impact. And kind of the last thing I'll talk about is the United States. Um, the rights of nature movement in the United States has been fun, let's say. Um, you know, this is kind of the heart of capitalism here. Um, and, you know, a lot of this nature is property uh, framework came from the United States and all the big company, a lot of big companies are here. So how did rights of nature fare here? Well, kind of, you know, kind of the first places in the world where rights of nature emerged, uh, for the most part, were in the U.S. in little towns that said, you know what, we don't, uh, there's fracking coming to town, there's industrial agriculture coming to town, we don't want that here, and the traditional environmental laws have failed us, they're not stopping them, and we're going to use rights of nature as like a last line legal defense against these things. Um, and they were well-meaning, they were passionate people who cared about their towns, um, but it didn't work in the courts so far. And uh, the reason is that uh, basically preemption issues. Um, preemption is where higher levels of government preempt the local levels of government. <clears throat> so if, if you're a company and you have a permit from the state government, permit from the federal government, and there's all these laws that say, hey, you got your two permits and you can, you know, do your extractive work in this town. Um, a local town can't just pass a law saying nature has rights and stop, and stop you. They're preempted. And you can think of all sorts of things that a local town could do that would also be contrary to state and federal law that maybe no one would like, you know, violations of civil rights and stuff if towns could just do whatever they wanted like that. Um, <clears throat> but from those cases, we've learned a lot. And there are some things that you can do in local governments. You can give a voice to nature. You can say, in our town, you know what? We're creating legal guardians to speak for nature. And there's a town in Colorado that next week, I hope, is going to do that. So keep an eye out for news updates after this. Um, you can say nature has a voice. You can center your town government around the idea that they will make decisions and defer in favor of the rights of nature, not in a way that's violating state and federal permits, but that is you know, within the fabric of the town. Santa Monica did that about 10 years ago, and it's stuck over all these years. Um, and then, you know, you can build a movement, in encourage people to uh, speak to nature, to, you know, say hi to a river, to understand they're part of the natural world, and, you know, create cultural shifts. And by the time the state and federal law catches up, which is where we need to go, uh, the local town will be in good shape. So we are working with local towns in Colorado, all throughout Washington, on kind of creating these softer approaches to embracing the idea that nature should have rights or a voice beginning to create institutions that do that, but not go so far as to, you know, try to overturn the whole regulatory system um, while, you know, building a movement. Um, what would this look like for the Great Salt Lake? Um, and we're actually working with a group, um, Save Our Great Salt Lake, you might have heard of them, as well as Save the Colorado, to look at what rights of the Great Salt Lake would look like with kind of this, starting with this sort of friendlier approach um, I won't go into the status quo of laws for the Great Salt Lake. Um, I'm sure you've talked about those in a lot of your classes. But, you know, what this might look like is a commitment by a local town to say that the rights of the Great Salt Lake are a primary consideration in their decision making and a commitment to give the lake a voice through a guardian. And I think that's pretty low stakes. I think it's a cool idea. Let the lake speak. What would it say? and to instill that in government. 
not that different from what's happened recently with you know, a, a trust advisory council and a Great Salt Lake advisory council that have both been created, except they've had some critique um, for, not, for including some stakeholders and not others, for example, not indigenous participation in those groups. Um, you know, what if a similar group was devised that was all about the interests of the lake, not multi-stakeholder, you know, farming and aquaculture and so forth, all about the lake, and it represented the lake legally. Um, that's kind of what we're talking about. Um, eventually, you could get to something stronger, a binding law, let's say at the state level. Um, one thing you could do here that's kind of like in Spain is you could say that um, the lake should be able to own water rights. And that's not that different than a lot of laws. In Colorado, the Colorado Water Conservation Board can own water rights on behalf of streams. In Utah, they recently changed the law, so different entities can own water rights temporarily on behalf of waterways. What if you just tweaked that a little bit and said, you know, let the eight lake itself own the water rights? That could be ecocentric rights of nature law. Um, whether you agree with that or not, you know, I encourage you to just kind of stretch your imagination a little bit and think about how can we give nature a voice and is this one way uh, that it would work? And then, you know, I wanted to mention also the public trust doctrine. You might have heard of this new case being brought using the public trust doctrine to protect the Great Salt Lake. And the argument, basically, if you've heard of like a trust in a, that's like an estate, um, you know, someone's like a state went into a trust. It's basically the same thing. There is a trustee, someone who manages the trust. Um, there's a beneficiary, someone you protect under, uh, or, or benefit under the trust. And there's a corpus or a res, which is, you know, the trust itself. And just to, in this example, um, trustee would be the state government. They have a duty to protect the Great Salt Lake, and the beneficiary is the public. This is called the public trust doctrine. It's an ancient Roman era uh, understanding that governments have a legal duty to protect um, what is commonly shared by all. And you know, in, in Utah's constitution and other state constitutions, it basically says the state has a public trust duty to protect oftentimes waterways or other natural entities on behalf of the public. And that can have a tension with or even supersede private property interests and there's a famous case called Mono Lake in 1979 with a, a um, you know, saltwater, salty lake, not that different than the Great Salt Lake. There's brine shrimp there. And there was you know, massive diversions to Los Angeles that was gonna result in the lake collapsing. Sound familiar? And um, there's a case using the public trust doctrine. And the court ruled that indeed the state of California has a duty under the public trust doctrine to uphold the integrity of this lake. And you know, so that's. The lake's still there, it's hanging in there. Um, and there's a case brought basically for the same thing for the Great Salt Lake saying the state of Utah has a duty to maintain water levels to 4,198 feet. That's been determined by science. And we'll see how it goes. It's, well, it's gonna be in the court you know, the next year or two and um, people have different opinions. It, it has a shot. Uh, it's not a slam dunk either. Um, last couple slides, um, animals. Are they persons or things? Anyone believe strong one way or the other? Status quo is things. There's a movement to say that animals are persons because they love, they have intelligence, they're a lot like humans. Just to note, this is different than the rights of nature movement. Um, animal rights is about protecting the rights of individual species, one animal, because humans are persons and those animals are a lot like us. Um, and it's different than the rights of nature, which is about protecting an entire ecosystem because it has a right to exist and is less concerned with one animal or if you want to swat a fly, swat a fly. It's more concerned with the, the health of this large system. There is a, a large, this is Kevin Schneider. He works with uh, Earth Law Center and was longtime director of the Non-Human Rights Project. Um, they file cases, including habeas corpus cases, which are common law cases that say, um, someone should be freed from imprisonment if they shouldn't be there. And find those cases on behalf of animals, like a captive elephant. This is Happy the Elephant in the Bronx Zoo uh, on behalf of a chimpanzee in a lab. Um, on behalf in Colorado of some giraffes in these tiny little cages. And you know they believe these animals should be treated as persons under the law um, for all the reasons that we're treated as persons. And hey, if corporations are persons, why can't Happy the Elephant be one too? Uh, so this is something uh, that's developing. 
Um, and then future generations. This is when I talk about voiceless entities and giving them a voice, I'm often talking about two things, nature, future generations. And um, I've talked a lot about nature. There's a lot to say about future generations. That just wasn't my focal point today. But a few things to say. Um, there are representatives legally of future generations in different countries. Uh, Hungary and Wales are two of those where they have legal bodies that speak for future generations, give them a voice. There's some a lot of constitutions that include the rights of future generations in them. Um, there are towns that are beginning to plan over decades, 100 years, to consider future generations and their basic planning decisions, Vancouver, BC. And this is the thing I'm most excited about. The uh, United Nations is, has proposed a special envoy for future generations. And this is basically going to be a body at the UN that speaks for the future, that represents them. It's going to have youth on it. It's going to have young leaders on it. And um, you think of the UN General Assembly. And I'm not sure they'll get in the General Assembly at some point. But you know, what if there were just two extra seats to start, one for future generations and one for nature, and they help make decisions on the international scale? Um, that's kind of coming to bear with in the United Nations. And then, you know, lastly, there's all these uh, cases in, in the U.S. brought by our Children's Trust and other groups asserting the rights of future generations in the courts. There was a huge win in, in Montana where uh, the court defended the uh, human right to a clean and healthful environment, as well as the right of future generations to a clean and healthful environment in invalidating a state policy that failed to consider climate change and planning decisions. So this is starting to show up in the U.S. courts as well. Um, I kind of think in the U.S. that future generations is something quite palatable for a broad scale of politicians who care about you know, their children and their children's children and might open the door to uh, rights and consideration for other voiceless entities, let's say nature. Um, have I said lastly already? I usually say lastly like six or seven times and then I give like the, ac I say actual lastly. Um, actual lastly, let's roll the dice. Um, there's a movement called Ecocide. Um, it's a movement to criminalize Ecocide, which is the wide scale, uh, you can see the definition here, the unlawful or wanton act committed with knowledge that there's a substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment. It's huge catastrophic harm to ecosystems that currently goes unpunished. You can think of things like climate change, uh, destruction of the Amazon, the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Um, these things slip through the cracks of the regulatory systems. Um, what if it was a crime at the International Criminal Court to destroy the planet is the basic premise. And actually, it is a crime to commit ecocide now. Um, and that came out of Vietnam when people used Agent Orange and uh, people um, used Agent Orange and you know, destroyed uh, forests and, and you know, were trying to get it at, um, at people but destroyed ecosystems as well. And then there's other instances of widespread harm to ecosystems during warfare. That's already criminalized in the International Criminal Court. Destroying ecosystems during warfare is international crime. Uh, everyone agrees on that. It's whether peacetime destruction of ecosystems is an international crime is the question. And there's a growing number of countries, especially in Europe, who think it should be. Um, and yeah, education. This is actual, actual, double actual, the last slide. Um, so there's all these cool things, just to sum it up. There's all these great things um, happening worldwide. Are great if you support them, or interesting if you don't. And you know, there's the rights of nature, giving nature a voice, uh, criminalizing the destruction of the planet, giving future generations a, boy, a voice, working with corporations to reimagine corporations as part of ecosystems. Uh, again, in my mind, none of these things are anti-corporate, anti-human in any way. They just reframe humans as part of nature, reframe our corporations as part of nature, and are, are about our well-being as part of nature as much as anything about our thriving future in relationship with nature. They're all happening worldwide, and uh, it's important to teach people about them as well. There's probably like, you know, when I started this work 10 years ago, there was maybe 50 people doing this worldwide. Now there's maybe, you know, 500 people doing it worldwide. We need a lot of people who have a uh, background in, in corporate law and governance, in, in science, in uh, indigenous legalities, in uh, animal welfare, um, in planning, uh, urban planning, and so forth, uh, to you know, help us innovate in this space, help us innovate to make some of these ideas a palatable reality that's understandable, enforceable, and, um, and widespread. And so um, we do have a law school course book. Uh, we do take summer interns. 
Um, we do offer online classes that are just the cost of a book, um, and uh, those are available every summer. And there's other groups doing this too. So if there's an area of this work that interested you, um, if you'd like to write a thesis or a paper on any of these topics, there's a lot of knowledge gaps still, and I love to send student theses um, over uh, our newsletter blast and say, look at this cool thesis, because no one read my thesis, and it bums me out. Um, <clears throat> You know, get in touch. Um, and then, you know, if you ever are interested in student clubs or getting involved in local activism, uh, there's a million things to do. If you don't like any of this stuff, uh, the, most, the most fun I have are rights of nature debates. So say, Grant, I challenge you to a debate, and let's do it. I just did one of those uh, last week on the East Coast, and it was, it was so fun. The ironic thing was I, it sharpened my thinking so much, I came up with like 30 good rights of nature ideas preparing for the debate. So it kind of backfired on the, the other person because now I'm doing all those things. Um, but debates are fun too. So, you know, promote education. If you like this stuff, ask for a class, uh, start a club, reach out to Earth Law Center or other groups. And um, I said final, final, and I'm a, a man of my final, final words, so I'll skip that one. Uh, so I think that's it. Let's open it to some questions and, you know, reactions, counterpoints, whatever you'd like. Yeah, uh, for the mic and for the record, are legal challenges the best way to advance egocentric law? They take a long time, many years, um, or are there other ways? Um, you know, the benefit of legal challenges are that they can take many years and you can stop a project for many years if you get an injunction, preliminary injunction. And sometimes people just sue with the idea of delaying and dragging it out and then things change and oh, we're gonna you know, not build that dam anymore or whatever it is, and that's a strategy for sure. Um, you know, in, in the U.S., the rights of nature court cases that, you know, were those little towns that were fighting against fracking and stuff, I mean, it kind of got, some of them got it handed to them and, you know, had to pay huge lawyer fees. You know, if you really lose epically, sometimes you have to pay lawyer fees for the other side, depending on the case. Um, you know, things like that. The system was kind of like, at first, like, revulsed by the idea of nature having rights and was really heavy-handed in the response. And, you know, that has a real impact on towns as well. Um, you know, my, my personal interest is, advancing uh, rights of nature cases that can win um, because I'm trying to set really good legal precedent. And I actually think some could in the US, they just have to be done a little differently and backed up by state laws and so forth. Um, but other legal strategies, no, I, th you know, I think um, getting, changing the legal framework is most important. Sometimes you know, these rights of nature cases are shots in the dark. You hope you get a good judge. You, know, you hope you have a positive political climate. It's, and, and, all movements for rights have been like that. And when you think of like the big civil rights cases, they were very carefully chosen, like fact patterns. And you know, Rosa Parks, like, oh, that's the perfect plaintiff. They're all very thoughtful because you kind of have to like squeeze through this history of oppression to change the status quo. And you know, when rights of nature does break through in the US, um, if and when, um, it'll kind of have to have that perfect fact pattern. But you know, in terms of other stuff you can be doing instead of litigation, I mean, Giving nature a voice, I think, is a really exciting thing right now because it builds the culture and understanding and challenges us to speak as nature and that you know, really like transforms consciousness. And I think we need to transform consciousness as well. Um, you know, education, um, writing new laws is important and we do a lot of work legislating new laws and so forth. So there's a million legal grassroots policy tools. Litigation's one of them and, and there's a lot of other good ones as well. So good question. Uh, yeah, I saw that hand and, and there and, and there. So to start off, I'd like to thank you for giving your talk tour here. It was wonderful to hear about all the things that are happening around the world. Um, I was wondering, so if you could talk a bit more on indigenous kingship. Um, it was something that I presented in my comprehensive exams that is not aggressively accepted by academia yet, right? Um, the concept of the ability to be related or family with, with nature, right? Um, 
So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more on the Lumi case study and what were some of the persuasive arguments that led to the, the release of the order. Yeah, almost release until it's almost. planned it's release. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so the kinship thing is interesting. I mean, one of the interesting things about it, oh, the question was say a little more about kinship. You know, it's maybe not widely accepted, at least as a legal theory or legal tool. Um, and say a little more about the, the Lummi Nation and the Orca case. Um, one of the interesting things about kinship is that um, you know, indigenous rights are upheld in our legal system. Um, indigenous peoples also have a right to their customary beliefs and understandings. And um, the fact that they are considered kin with many more than human species and ecosystems can be a bridge between you know, their relationships with nature and Eurocentric legal systems that protect indigenous rights, but maybe not the rights of those sacred species and waters and so forth that they're kin with. So, that, you know, legally, it's, there's something there. Um, in terms of the Lummi, I mean, one thing we looked at is um, there's this law called NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. And it says that uh, basic museum institutions, it's mostly um, museums and universities, um, shall return sacred objects to, um, uh, to indigenous peoples from which they were taken. And it's often like you know, an artifact, or it can be a, even a family member, like their remains. Um, and we kind of looked at that and said, well, you know, what if it could apply to you know, a family member that was sacred to a people and taken from them? And there's actually some really good arguments that that law can be applied to living species that are sacred or kin to indigenous peoples. And that's something interesting to look at. And, Someone just wrote a great law journal article about that topic for wolves. Um, you know, for, for the other part of just like a family member, I mean, we, talk, we talked about going to family court um, based on this orca that was taken. And, you know, there's this long history um, where all these orcas were taken. And, you know, there's also a history of indigenous family members and children being taken and brought to boarding schools and their culture is extinguished and there's, you know, atrocities uh, committed that are just being unearthed all the time, including where I live in Durango. And, you know, and so there was this simil similar story of orcas being taken and you know, their culture extinguished because she's alone in a tank and she speaks a language and can't talk to anyone anymore, couldn't until she passed. Um, and then also the culture of uh, the Lummi being in relationship with orcas is being extinguished because the orcas are going extinct. There's only 73 southern resident orcas left. And, and um, you know, they're at grave risk of extinction because mostly because of damming that devastates salmon populations. And so, yeah, we thought about going to family court, tribal court, um, and um, you know, we ended up working when there was a new owner. And I kind of phased off around this time, but they ended up working with the new owners who um, you know, agreed with them. So we never kind of got to that stage of testing some of these things. But I think there are some creative legal arguments there. Um, if something's upheld in tribal court, then you have to see if, it, if it's given deference in like a federal court, but that's possible. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting subject, and I think the interface between law, indigenous rights, and then kinship with, with nature and species is something that will continue to develop and would be interesting to explore more. Um, I saw a couple, yeah, go ahead. How do you decide who represents a river? This is the hardest and most interesting question, which is like a whole like eight class series to cover it. A couple things, who, who shouldn't represent a river? Uh, some of the guardianship bodies that exist like in Colombia, uh, the government's kind of like holding on to the power a little bit in that um, like in Colombia, they said, okay, for the river, we're gonna choose um, two members, or it turned out to be eight members of Riverside Afro-Colombian indigenous community members. They're considering themselves to be part of the river. Like, that's a good idea. Let's pick them. And they kind of like community institutions nominated who exactly. Um, then they said the other half of the guardianship body is going to be the government. And I'm like, what, the government? Like, are, are they really going to represent the best interests of the river? Government's more into balancing things. Let's balance economics with nature, with all these interests. That serves a purpose. I get that. You know, I get governments, multi-stakeholder. But if the goal is to represent purely the interest of a river, you know, the governmental multi-stakeholder model, I don't think is the best one. But that's what they did. I think they're kind of scared to go all in on the 
community members. Um, you know, I would pick people who have a close cultural connection to an ecosystem. You know, in, indigenous peoples who have a history or cultural connection to an ecosystem, if they were interested in that. Not all are interested in the rights of nature stuff. Um, I would pick um, people trained in ecocentric law, earth law, who understand like how this works. Um, and if they weren't, I you know I might suggest they get some training first. Um, I would pick scientists um, who have an understanding of that ecosystem, people with uh, traditional environmental knowledge related to an ecosystem, and then you need oversight. You need to say, you know, if this person's not performing their functions, then you know they there's a way to basically sue them or bring them to an administrative body for review and see if they have some you know, ulterior motive or something. And then, you know, if you're not doing your job, you get replaced just like with other, you know, trustees and guardians of people. Um, you know, the, I mentioned something earlier, you know, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. I think just getting people, you know, in, in, in governments and in institutions speaking for nature is a good thing. So I'm, I'm not gonna be the one to like raise a big stink if like I don't think it's the right person. I'm gonna be like, good, let's all like start speaking for nature and like that's gonna make the world a better place. So I think we'll learn a lot and even if it's not like the perfect person, you know, like Gaia, like in, in the human form speaking for nature, like that's cool. Like let's all, let's work on it. Let's get like some CEOs to go in the boardroom and speak for nature. It's all, it's all good stuff. Uh, yeah, in the back. Oh, yeah, so the question is, could there be an AI program or entity speaking for nature? And um, this is quietly becoming a hot topic in the rights of nature space, in fact. Um, and there's different perspectives. Some people are like, you feed all the knowledge to the AI and you create this like perfect entity that has no human ulterior motive or ego involved. It just like does its job and that's pretty good. Other people are like, well, what about like the biases of the programmers and isn't the whole like tech industry like this like commodif commodifying system and like isn't, isn't this just good? like, shouldn't we be listening to indigenous peoples and not just like AI and programmers? And then other people are like, well, let, let like these people with a really close relationship to nature and indigenous partners program the AI, that, doesn't that solve it? And, and other people are like, no, it's, it's, it's just a chatbot, you know, it's just, that New York Times article that came out with ChatGBT where, you know, it like fell in love with the guy, that was just predicting the most likely next word. It has no sentience, like it, it's, a, it's nothing else but, it, you know, the, the words it's finding on the internet. Um, other people are like, oh yeah, feed it your earth law textbook and like all the history of environmental ethics and it'll do an awesome job of speaking for nature. Uh, there's lots of discourse about it. The, you know, reading the room, I get a feeling of, hesitancy and mistrust from a lot of people in the movement. Um, I think someone's inevitably gonna do it. Um, and in fact, I know someone who I think is gonna do it very soon. Um, and then, you know, we'll learn from it and people will come out and say, this is a horrible idea. And other people will say, wait, it's working. And there'll be, a, there'll be debates. This will probably be the next time I come here to talk about this, this issue. So yeah, there is some interest. Um, I think it's a really interesting area. You know, my, my gut is if you do something like that to, you know, have, have some oversight still, or, but have that be informative, but not dispositive. Um, but yeah, it's an inter interesting question. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh yeah. And um, and can you talk about sort of when you might use another argument around kind of framing in a human rights perspective, kind of the rights of nature, or which is still, of course, anthropocentric, but versus an ecocentric approach? I mean, do you feel like you take the approach that's 
most likely to get an outcome, or mm -hmm. is your approach to kind of create precedent of the rights of nature hmm. in the legal framework? Yeah, so talk a little bit about rights of nature versus the human right to nature, and you know, that, that can be anthropocentric, of course, and you know, what strategies do we take? First of all, I'll say Earth Law Center, you know, we're all about uh, being good lawyers that understand the full scope of Earth Law movements. And you know, I, I have my personal views. I try not to take strong positions even as, as to which approach is better or worse. And, I try to give really good legal advice as a lawyer, just like a good corporate lawyer gives good legal advice to corporations on, on you know, what ecocentric law approach might work, what the benefits are, what the risks are. Um, I work with people who think rights of nature sucks because it's just more like colonial rights-based laws and like what are we wasting our time for? And you know, we work together jo just jolly because you know, I take the perspective that there's a lot of approaches out there, but you need good lawyers to inform how they work. Um, just to make that disclaimer, but for the, yeah, the human right to nature, you know, this gets to the idea that, you know, humans have a right to access nature, to be in nature. Um, I, I do think part of what we do is transforming consciousness and building relationships between humans and nature. And you have to be out in nature um, to do that. And I do think that humans have a right to, you know, be out in nature and experience nature and equity, um, you know, to the extent that the human right to nature gets into like, you know, ownership over nature, you know, that's when things get, you know, kind of separated a little bit. Um, but, you know, again, I, I, I can think of any movement and any law, for the most part, in an ecocentric manner. And when I think of the human right to nature, you know, I think of it more of our right uh, um, to, you know, form relationship with nature, and I do think that's important. Um, eventually, you know, rights-based stuff and Western laws are kind of training wheels towards, you know, forming this renewed relationship and ethic with nature that's, you know, the baseline of society and culture. And, you know, the human right to nature, to the extent that it means, like, we're experiencing nature and learning nature, I think is important. Um, but if it's, you know, about ownership, and uh, then it's a little bit of, of a gap. But um, I think every, you know, everyone in these fields should, should kind of know the dynamics of all these different movements, and they, they do interplay with each other and can support each other, I like to think. Please join me.